Good morning. Welcome. Uh, my name is Keith Simmons, and I am one of many people in ministry here at Central Okanagan United Church, along with all of you and the folk here who are helping us get the service together. Uh, I haven't been here very long. This is still the first time most of you have seen me in my alb. I remember the first time I wore my alb in Duncan, and I heard somebody in the back say, Finally, a real minister. So, <laughs> it's a bit about it, our demographics and where we come from. Sometimes, I think in the life of the church, we as ministry personnel need to take on a role that's the church, a sort of a priestly role. And one of those times is when we have a baptism, because it's the whole church engaged in baptism, and we have that today. So we're, we're gifted to be part of this welcoming of another into our community and so I take on the the role of the church in this particular service but not for a little while so before I move fully into that we're going to talk about welcome and announcements and I think we have a few things to remind people of like we're pleased to be joined by by folk among us and I should also let you know that Cheryl very much wanted to be here this morning, um, but she somehow contracted COVID and is not able to be with us today. And so she's, I'm sure, watching to make sure I don't get it too wrong <laughs> because she's laid this out very carefully. She's an incredibly good organizer and I hope to stick true to the plan. As the first thing she asked me to do is to welcome visitors and to say, so if there's anybody who'd like to introduce themselves or a visitor, this would be a really good time to do it. Anyone? It's not usually, okay. Thank you, Tina, very much. Do you have any, any other visitors that would like to introduce themselves or? Oh, yes, okay. All right. Lindsay George from the Grand Prairie United Church. Here now. Thank you. Welcome. We have some other folks here who know something about Grand Prairie too, I think, so <laughs> probably a few of us. Somebody else? Where am I? Oh, here we are. Yes. My name is Gladys Brown. Gladys Brown. Yeah. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Some hot and hard. Well, we will uh, we will be introducing more people in the course of the service as well. So we shall see. Oh, somebody just noticed the balloon. Ah. <laughs> what goes up will come down eventually. <laughs> and now I think we. Uh, Besides being reminding us to join join us for coffee after church, I think there are a couple of other things to be reminded about as well. So we could probably start with with that. Morning, everybody. I'm here to remind you of the Sparkle Tour that's coming up on December the 10th. So the Sparkle Tour is something we've done here for a few years, and what it is is for people who either don't drive anymore or people who drive but they don't like to drive at night and would like to get out and see the Christmas lights. There's wonderful displays of Christmas lights around Kelowna. So what we do, it, what the whole plan is, is we pick you up at your home at about four o'clock. You drive around, look at the lights for 40, 45 minutes, come back to the church, have a cup of cider and a cookie and we take you home about six o'clock. So this is, um, I've. My last two drivers I needed volunteer this morning, so I've got all the drivers I need now. And I'm just looking for people interested in going around and looking at the lights. And the new newcomers are most welcome. We'd love to take you around and we'd give you a chance to come and socialize back at the church and get to know a few people. So if you're interested, the notice is in the bulletin or in the newsletter, or just phone Tanya, she'll keep a list for us. I'm assuming, Tanya, you'll keep a list for us in the office <laughs> of people who need a ride. Okay, thank you. Don't be shy, sign up if you'd like to go see the lights. All right, thank you. And Jim's here someplace. There you are, there you go. morning. If I'm up here, what am I talking about? Thank you. You nailed it right on. Um, just a reminder, there are clipboards on, on all the pews. I need some help on Friday. We're having a prep party to get all the potatoes done, the stuffing organized, etc. Um, on the Saturday, I'm going to need, um, I think, eight more apple crisps uh, to be brought and donated. Thank you very much. And I need a really good cleanup and teardown crew. So don't be afraid, I need you to help. And for the silent auction, we have quite a few items, but we could always use more. So if you think about, you'd like to do a silent auction, we have pottery, we have art. Judy and I are doing a primer of dinner for eight people with wine um, and stuff like that. So we would gladly take more donations for the silent auction. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next Saturday night, Christmas turkey dinner. Tickets available in the office for those who are joining us via Zoom and would like to pick something up. All right, and uh, just one more piece that I wanted to let you know about, and that's um, something Terry Walsh should, would normally be up here to talk to you about, and that's sort of where we are in terms of what we're doing about buildings and facilities and things like that. As you know, we have uh, two sites right now. We have a, a site in Rutland and the site here, and we have a wealth of opportunities in front of us. We're just not too sure exactly what to do with them. There are lots of possibilities, and there's a facilities report that's coming out in, in our electronic newsletters to say what some of those possibilities are. But before we actually get down to the, that level of detail, our region of the the church regional office, which is currently located in Burnaby, has taken note that some churches have gone through a total planning process and torn their building down, completely rebuilt their building, and then didn't have everything in it that they needed. 
because they forgot something crucial. There was a church they told us about that, whose ministry was really about food. They really wanted to invite people in. They put on a lot of community dinners. A lot of people came to dinner and came to be fed. Actually, sounds like a United Church anywhere, but they were specifically about that. And so when they rebuilt their building, they discovered that they hadn't put a commercial kitchen in, uh, which didn't really, nobody could figure out why they'd missed that. So the region now wants us to say, who are we? What's our plan for ministry? What, what do we want to do, particularly in our own community? and then plan a building based on that, not perhaps let the building plan the ministry for us. So we're gonna do some work in late January and February, have some conversations. And we're gonna base those conversations on the four key areas of ministry that were identified in the amalgamation. And that would be worship and music, be pastoral care, it would be intergenerational ministry and community ministry. Those are our kind of four key areas that focus for the amalgamated congregations. And so in those areas, each of those areas, what are we doing that we uphold and celebrate? What do we think, well, I was hoping that wouldn't start up again after COVID. And, and what's there in the future? What are the potentials and the opportunities for us that lie ahead of us? So we'll think about those things in some conversations in January and February, and that should help us figure out then which part of the facilities plan do we go with? So through Advent, we're hoping that in each service, we'll have a chance to reflect on maybe a different part of that ministry. This is our first week in Advent. Advent is the time before Christmas. Advent is a time when we enter into reflection. And in this week, the week in which we celebrate hope, you might think about the kind of world we hope to live in, the kind of place we'd like to be, the kind of folk we'd like to be. What do we hope for as we care for one another? So let's think of that as we enter into this time of Advent and reflect with our introit. Welcome, welcome to the preface, welcome to the before time. There are whispers in the portico, ancient stories creaking out of memory and rising into life. Ordinary people are standing in the gates, taking prophetic shape. Miracles are happening, men are stepping back, women lead. Angel choruses are warming up. Shepherds dream uneasy in anticipation. What does this mean for the flock? Love is coming. Love is coming. Love.
is coming. Let's sing People Look East and Voices United number nine. If you'd like the music, it's in the big red hymn book or the words should appear on the screens. be seated. <clears throat> now we enter into a time of reflection of considering who we are and where we are. We are known as people on the way. We walk on the way with Christ. We are about the journey, not so much the destination. We know we're not there yet. We are on the way. And as we are people on the way, sometimes we bump off the way from time to time. We trip, we fall, we stumble, we wander off the path. And so let us consider our wanderings and our going off the path in this prayer for the day, uh, an acknowledgement of ongoing brokenness. Loving one, sometimes we are content to consign your presence to a distant past or perhaps a prophetic future. From time to time, you could be a source of presence and so we turn to you for solace, seek comfort in your arms, and yet rarely, rarely do we allow your loving heart to disrupt us, to dislodge us, destabilize us. Sometimes in fear of the consequences of love's insistence, sometimes we turn away. Forgive us our turning away. Let us know in the assurance that God brings through Christ, through the new child at Christmas, that love is always there, just beckoning, sometimes with startling consequences. <laughs> love beckons, love startles, love calls us back into relationship. We are called inward, we are called home. Love won't let us go. And so as we consider that and we light, I'm going to invite some folks up to uh, 
to light our first candle in Advent. Courtney and Andrew and Ellie and Heather. The tradition. I think it should just come on. The tradition of lighting candles one to represent each Sunday in the season of Advent, helps us remember that though all around us, the Christmas carols are already celebrating, we are waiting. The season of Advent is a season filled with an entirely different, life-giving kind of waiting, an expectant, audacious, hope-filled waiting that looks forward to the coming of the one who reveals love, joy, justice, and peace. Let us turn our hearts and minds to waiting for Jesus and the fulfillment of God's promises. Today is the advent of hope. We offer one another and the wide world prayer and commitment, holding hearts and hands, sharing warm, long moments together, making room at the table. How else might we live out love's insistence to care? Light a candle as a prayer for healing. We light this candle for the one who is coming, hope of the world. I know. I blew the script. Sorry. It probably won't be the last time. We will sing now uh, from an uh, adaptation of Voice United 70, our Advent song. Yeah, you can stand, sure. Please be seated. And now I think I, I need to call some people forward. I need kids to help me. I need a lot of help, so come on up. I think there's some things I need to get while you're coming up, too. Let's see. What do I need to get? Hmm. Yeah, you can sit right there. That's good. Now, I have some things here that we're going to use in a little while. What do you think this is? Let's see. Popcorn? I don't think it's popcorn. It could, popcorn does come in those bags. It's straw. Hmm. What do we need straw, do you think? Okay, go ahead. Tell me. 
start filling up the, well, the, not just the manger, but that whole, that whole little building over there. You know what we call that sometimes? When I was in Palestine, they always called it a creche, is what they called it there. A creche. It was the place where the manger was. In Advent, we're getting ready. We're remembering this story. Do you think we're the first ones to remember this story? No. How long have we been remembering this story? What do you think? Okay, you tell me, how long? All our lives, maybe, and our parents' lives, yes, go ahead. 2,022 years, that's probably about right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time, eh? Yeah? Yeah, and you're three, so there's a long, long time. And you'll get to remember this story and tell it to people who aren't here yet. Just as the people who aren't here anymore told us this story. It's a long story, old story. Advent's about waiting. It means getting ready for something incredible to happen. Did you know that a long time ago, when they first told this story, about years ago, they told this story, they were waiting for him to come. His, they called that person by a special name. It was, does anybody out here know what that name was? The coming of the, Handel sings the Messiah. Yes, the Messiah. And the Messiah meant it was going to come and save everybody. This is having a real hard time. But the people wouldn't hear me on Zoom, is the thing. You got high top shoes. Wow. So cool. Thanks. All right. Is that better? Can you hear me? Does it sound? Oh, yes. Okay. So, what was I saying? Oh, about 3,000 years ago, people talked about the coming of the Messiah. There were people, prophets, people like Isaiah. Jeremiah, there were prophets who said somebody's going to come and change the whole world. And they thought it would be somebody who came at the head of a great big army and was going to come and save them from people that were being mean to them. That's what they thought was going to happen. They were pretty sure that that's how they would be saved. So imagine their surprise when what happened instead? Do you know what happened on Christmas Eve? What do we think? Jesus was born. A little baby. How could a little baby help? That's something we have to think about at Advent. How do little babies help us? How do they save the world? Because they do. But that's what we're going to think about in a little while. We're also going to talk a bit about getting ready with Sarah. Sure, do you want to come up? Okay. Come on over. Because when babies come, there are some things we have to do to get ready. So, we're going to share. <laughs> you go ahead. What, what do we need to do to get ready? Sure. To get ready to have a baby, we have to get our house ready. Hmm. We have to get a crib sometimes and get diapers and um, think about maybe putting some sharp things away. And we have to think about how we're not going to get any sleep, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Totally. <laughs> and I had to do that when Jonathan was going to be four. And Jonathan is three. He's going to be baptized today, but that's because he was born right before COVID. So he's going to have his baptism today when he's three. But we're going to be back. No, I think I am. <laughs> we're going to we'll be back again because we're going to have a baby. Yes, so another baby coming pretty soon. Mm -hmm. 
All right. We have to prepare people's expectations too. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty excited. Yes, it's pretty exciting. It's like Christmas and Christmas again. Your whole life does change. It's your oh, the same month as your birthday and your mom's birthday. All right, that'll be good. Month. Now, what we're going to do is we talked about baptizing Jonathan. I think that's what we're going to do next. So, could I get you guys to just move maybe over this way? Just over on this side so that we can clear this space because we have a few more folks coming up. Oh, just a second. I forgot this piece. Yes, this stuff. Can you take these things and put them in that stable? Maybe not in the bags, though. Yeah, that, that's a good way to get you over there, too. I'll bet you that's why Cheryl had that planned. Oh, wow. She's pretty smart. Whoop. My brother got one. Okay, did he get one? <laughs> sure. There's more. Have we done it all yet? Probably just in here somehow. Yep. I think maybe this whole list. All right. Well, welcome. Dustin, Jared, and Vicki. Okay, so Dustin, Sarah, Jonathan, Madeline, Vicki, and Jared. All right, and we're all here. Okay, that's the first part. And we have parents and godparents, and we are going to bring Jonathan into our community in this way that we have in the United Church, this sacrament of baptism. Baptism is a moment in the Christian community when we recognize the grace of God that lives in every person. The sacrament of baptism proclaims and celebrates the grace of God. Here's a, a record of Jesus' concern, the way he wants us to welcome children. It says that people were bringing children to Jesus in order that he might bless them. And the disciples, they were pretty stern with those people. They said... When Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he told them, You let those little children come to me. Don't stop them, for it is to these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. And Jesus took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. And so now it's time to ask Tanya to present. Thank you, Jan. On behalf of the Congregation of Central Okanagan United Church, it's my pleasure to present Jonathan Michael Gumpinger, son of Dustin and Sarah, for initiation into the body of Christ through baptism. Thank you, 
Tanya. Baptism for infants and young children proclaims the unconditional grace and the love of God. It's also a reminder of the wonder and the blessing and the new responsibilities that come with a new life. And so I asked Jonathan's parents, who make these promises on behalf of their child, Sarah and Dustin, do you believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, and who works in us and others by the Spirit? Desiring freedom of new life in Christ, will you seek to resist evil and to live in love and justice? Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ? Will you share your faith with Jonathan, growing with him in faith and hope and love? And it's for godparents, it's a special tradition in the Christian church to name godparents. You've been chosen because you've been present at many significant events in Dustin and Sarah's lives. You've supported them and rejoiced in the birth of Jonathan. And recognizing that there are many people who touch the lives of children beyond their parents, do you covenant to help Jonathan remember this day and to nurture him on his spiritual journey? Now we're going to ask the children to stand because there's a part for you too. So you guys get to stand up. Yeah, you can stand up too. That's right. You're part of this. Okay. Do you, as, these, as the children of Central Okanagan United Church, promise to include Jonathan in playing and in learning? And will you welcome him into your Sunday school? And will you show him respect? And you get to say, we will, God being our helper. Thank you. And you can stay standing because everybody else gets to stand now as they are able. And you'll see words for us on the screen. Let us pledge to these persons our support and our care. As a baptized and baptizing people, we commit ourselves to support and uphold you within the community of faith. May God grant us all the grace to live out our baptism. And the people say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And now, Madeline, I need your help. Can you help? Is there anything in there? There's nothing in there. What, what do we do about that? Can we pour some water in there? Yep. All right. So could you get that? Is that, is that okay? Okay. So you get to pour it in there. Right into the bowl. Well, mostly. As we enter this season of Advent, of preparation for the celebration of Jesus' birth, we remember that when Jesus was born, it was as if God's love overflowed, spilling out of the world and making our ordinary life a very special life, giving us a joy that we never had before. May God's Spirit be upon us and upon this water that we now use to baptize and welcome with joy this child into our church family. Now, I explained to the parents, and I just want to say to you, in case you don't know, that we have agreements with other churches, other parts of the Christian communion, and so there are certain words that we use in baptism that are important to every church, and we said we'd use them. Then there are words that are important to us, and we thought, well, we can add them. And so we're, we're doing a little bit of, and then there were some other words we thought, those are beautiful, we'll add those too. So we're going to baptize Jonathan. First of all, in the Holy Communion of the Holy Church, oh, it's okay, are you okay? okay? So we're going to bring Jonathan right here, and I'm going to say, Jonathan, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And guess what? I get to do it again. I baptize you, Jonathan, in the name of our Creator, our Redeemer, sustainer. And you know what? One more time, because we're a Trinitarian church, in the name of the mother, the child, and holy wisdom embodied in Ruach, 
Jonathan, I baptize you into the blessed community of Christ. May the blessing of one God, mother and father of us all, be with you all today and always. Yes. And now... So this oil comes from a place that, that we now know as Palestine. It's made from olives in Palestine. And guess where Jesus was born? He was born in Palestine. Yes, that's where he was born, in a little town. Well, it was small then. It's big now. A place called Bethlehem. And so this oil comes from there. And so it's also our tradition to mark with the sign of the cross. And so we say, Jonathan... In the sign of the cross, you are marked as Christ forever. And now we're all going to lay hands on Jonathan. And this will be an interesting part for all of us, I'm sure. Okay, come on, guys. Jonathan is, can we, can we hold hands? Okay, let's all hold hands. Come on, guys. Oh, we need more people. Children, yes. This is part of our promise. Okay, hold hands. Yeah, okay, you got him. All right, come in, put a hand on Jonathan someplace. All right. Jonathan, so we're going to say some words now. We're going to say, Jonathan, may the Holy Spirit loves power, guide you, inspire you, and work within you all the days of your life. And the people say, Amen. Amen. Welcome, Jonathan. Now, no. there's, there's one more thing we get to do. Remember we talked earlier about your candle? Right off the blue candle. A little more. Oh. There you go. Now bring it to Jonathan. And we could say, Jonathan, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to God. Hope. Oh. Has to get closer, I guess. There you go. All right. And so, I'm not sure what the tradition is here, but in the church I was in, the parents would take the new one around so that people could say hi. Are you okay with doing that? Would you like to go around and say hi? And do you want to put that back in the box? <laughs> Carrying is probably going to work, maybe. You got to go say hi? Later. Later. <laughs> oh, good. Very well. So let's say hello, Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, welcome. Thank you all very much. Thank you. 
This is what Isaiah, son of Amoz, prophesied about Judah and its capital, Jerusalem. There will come a time in the last days when the mountain where the Eternal's house stands will become the highest, most magnificent, grander than any of the mountains around it and all the nations of the world will run there wanting to see it, feel it, experience it. Many people of all languages, colors, and creeds will come. To the house of the God of Jacob, so that we might learn from him how best to be, to go along in life as he would have us go. After all, 
the law will pour out from Zion, the word of the Eternal from Jerusalem. God will decide what's fair among nations and settle disputes among all sorts of people. Meanwhile, they will hammer their swords into sickles, reshape their spears into pruning hooks. One nation will not attack another. They will not practice war anymore. Our second reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 24 regarding the eschatological era. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let the house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Words for us to contemplate today from our scriptural traditions. Thanks be to God. That seems to be working too, but I have the backup, so we'll see. I saw the bell ringers come out and I thought, oh, I guess I'm not doing the sermon, but no, here we are. <laughs> Currently I am. Uh, well, I could, I could have forgotten that I'd forgotten to do that because I forgot to do the land acknowledgement at the beginning of the service. 
these things discombobulate you, don't they? From time to time, uh, the unexpected just jumps up and says, okay, let's, let's try this out and do this. And although I've spent most of my time in ministry um, being the one who kind of does most of the parts, I've gotten so used to not being that one that I forgot how to get there again. Sometimes that happens. We are dislocated and discombobulated by what's going on in our lives. I think Isaiah is writing about those times. Isaiah, first Isaiah, we're told by many scholars, not all perhaps, but many, that Isaiah is a, a lot of different people writing over a long stretch of time. When you think about it, the first Isaiah is talking about things are bad, they're going to get worse, be better, or they'll get worse. And then they do get a lot worse, and, and then, then they get a lot better. And that's over a long period of time. So unless Isaiah was a very, very, very long-lived person, there were lots of people writing in that voice, that prophetic voice of Isaiah. This Isaiah, first Isaiah, is telling us at the beginning what the hope is for at the end. That at the beginning, we're starting to get more and more disrupted and things are looking pretty bad. We're where the people have forgotten their covenants, where the wealthy have looked on the poor as places to reap a harvest, uh, where they've forgotten that they promised to look after and care for one another, where they've forgotten that when they left Egypt, they said, I will never be enslaved again. It also meant I will never enslave another. You know, I will have jubilee. I will have ways to be in relationship that are different. They've forgotten all of that. And you can see the society and its support systems starting to crumble. And Isaiah and many other prophets are saying, pay attention, pay attention. If you don't change your ways, the whole thing is going to fall apart. If you turn away from the promises you made to one another and to God, then God will no longer be in the promise and the covenant and the relationship. There just won't be any room. Some of our our prophets writing about different times in the course of the world of world events have said. God has become small and shrinking and weak because we have become small and shrunken and weak. We are no longer participating in the covenants that we made. But Isaiah says this might be happening now, but there will be a time when we all come together again, when we take the weapons of war and all the things that we've used in conflict with one another and we turn them into something else, something wonderful, something that brings new life, something that makes the ground prepared for new life to be brought forth, that the swords and the spears will be turned into plowshares, implements by which we feed one another. That time is coming, Isaiah says, it's coming. As Christians, we look to that time as a, a prophetic time announcing the advent of Jesus, of the birth of love on earth. And we look back at those prophets as I was saying to the children, at a time expecting an armed warrior to lead them to victory again, as they've been in victory many times before, what we got instead was this small, we helpless child. I think that's a gift that Christianity has to bring to the conversation that we have about the divine and the eternal and the call to love. One of our particular gifts is this gift that love does not come as a conqueror, really. Love doesn't come to lay waste. Love doesn't come to throw down people and crush them and destroy them. That's not how love works. Love works by pulling you entirely out of yourself. Relationship with that which you had not been in relationship before. I, I, I only have my own life to refer to, like my own experiences. I can read but my, in my own experience, in my own life, I experienced that kind of love when I had a child. And I really understood that there wasn't anything that I wouldn't do. It wouldn't matter. Like if there was a, I don't know, a truck coming down the road towards the both of us and only one of us got out of the way, it would be my child. I just, there would be no question about that. It's the love that pulls you completely out of yourself. And I think there's a reason that in our storytelling, in Matthew and Luke, we have a child to pull us out of ourselves. A child that is small and helpless and weak without us. But a child 
of who can command in us the greatest of all things, love. And so it's interesting to think of Christ in that way, that Christ child in that way, to call us into love and loving relationship that we go to protect and care for one another in Christ, as we say as Christians, that we have this reading from Matthew. What's that about? We have this sense of the call to love, and then we have this apocalyptic reading from Matthew that when the Son of Man comes, some will be left, be, you know, left and some will be taken. Some will understand and be ready, and some will be and not ready at all. And how does that work? If God is in loving relationship with all of us, how does that work? What makes sense of that? It's something we wondered about when I was at theological school, like, how can this be? And so you, for me, I, I go looking to see what other people have thought about that because I didn't really have any original thoughts about it myself. So I went to look to see what others said. And one of the readings um, that came to me talked about this as, as Matthew saying something quite different and that we should look at it quite differently. In fact, that whole series of readings like this in the book of Revelation um, and in some parts of Matthew, the apocalyptic readings, uh, there's a, a fellow who's called, uh, he calls himself a pyro theologian. His name is Peter Rollins. He's an Irishman. He's got some amazing theological ideas and perspectives. And Peter Rollins wrote a little booklet that I have in my office, and it's about, it's about um, this kind of a reading. And in that booklet, which is written like a graphic novel, you can first see Peter coming to God in heaven, and the figures look like they just came down from the Sistine Chapel. And Peter says, there's a whole bunch of people here. And God says, oh, where'd they come from? And he said, well, they all came from Earth. He said, well, what are they doing here? Well, they said, there's, there's a horrible situation on planet Earth. There's floods and fires and famines and there's diseases and everything is going to heck in a handbasket. And so they've left. And God said, what, and they came here? And Peter said, yeah, they've, they've come here. And God said, well, what are they doing here? And Peter said, well, they said that, you know, when things are really horrible on earth, that's what you do, you go to heaven. And God said, come on, let's get moving. And Peter said, what, where are we going? He said, well, to earth, clearly they need us there. Where are we needed? Where would God be in times of trouble when there's fear and famine and hunger and disease and warfare? Up there for a few of us are right here rooted with all of us. I'm told that if you read that reading from Matthew like that, then the ones who are taken out of those communities are the ones you wouldn't want to be. If you lived in the times when the Romans came and took you, that was not a good thing. If they came through your community and a bunch of you disappeared, it wasn't going to a good place or a better place. It was going to a place where you might never be seen again. You'd be separated from your families. The ones that were left behind, were the ones that were called to continue on in the work and the ministry and the care and the attentiveness of being in relationship with one another. That they were the ones who were chosen. They were the ones who, who stayed. The ones who stayed. I just saw an article on uh, social media someplace, a, a piece of video from a stadium in Japan. It was apparently amazing to the world that they'd had this big event in this stadium and a lot of the people who'd, who'd been there to watch it stayed behind to pick up all the garbage and the debris before they left, which was amazing to everybody else in the world. Why would you do something like that? <laughs> they stayed to look after what was going on. That was part of it. We were at dinner last night at the Advent New Year's dinner, and we were, um, we, we just had a great day, and we decorated it set things up in the sanctuary in the hall and did all kinds of crafts and we had a potluck dinner and we sat down to dinner and as we were getting up and cleaning so instead of trying to figure out how to get my kids to realize that you pick up your plate and deal with it at the end of dinner that that's something that we do stay behind to help that's who we are and so I think this reading from Matthew and Isaiah Isaiah is saying this will come. It will happen. Have no doubt. Be careful in God's love. That the advent that we hope for and we dream for is not some warrior or some huge strong person, somebody who commands the armies of the world or all the missiles. 
It's somebody who will pull us out of ourselves so that we recognize that we are in a relationship of love and we remember that we were once that baby. We were once the one and we can still be that one. That we pull the world out of itself and into a relationship with love. Matthew says, just stick around and enjoy, perhaps, being in a world where all those who are here are engaged in the ministry of being one, of living in the truth of Advent, of figuring out how together through care and through making sure that the generations are connected, part of one another, through worship and praise, and through making sure that we're not an island, but are connected to the community around us, how through all of that, living here and now, left behind, left with purpose, how can we create that world that Isaiah still dreams of, and that we go to bed every night in Advent, we too hope for. We hope for the coming of the shalom of God, which is much more than peace. Shalom, the conditions, the ground upon which peace is built, the place where we are all one in the heart of God. Let us think of that as we pray. Let us pray. Loving God, you call us to relationship again and again and again. You never leave us behind, but are always there with us. Every day and every way, we are in relationship with you. And so be with us now as on this day as on all days. We recognize we are a part of the world and look for the love that is there waiting to call us out of ourselves and into you. Amen.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy One, in our world racked by violence, divisiveness, hostility, brutal wars, how we long with Isaiah for a time when wars will end and people will come together to share your gifts and blessings together. We name our desires for an end to injustice, to intolerance and prejudice, to the false belief that to have a good life, we have to dominate and push others down who would infringe on our privileges. Open our eyes to perceive that there is enough for everyone to recognize that only as others thrive can we also thrive, to comprehend the meaning and the message of the Lord we profess, that all of us are called to be family, part of us. The media constantly keep before us stories of mass killings, of war atrocities, of demonizing those who are not just like us. We pray for the victims of these injustices, and we also pray for the perpetrators of these injustices, for all of us need healing, whether of woundedness or of mistaken beliefs that we are justified to dehumanize others. We pray for the zealots of every religious tradition who believe that they are called by you, God, to force their beliefs on everyone else by whatever means is necessary, that they may receive clearer vision that you are love and call all of us to love one another. The world's problems and crises are so huge now it is not easy to see how each of us can make a difference in a world imploding upon itself. Open our eyes to notice opportunities to bring a ray of love and caring into the life of another, for this is not beyond our ability. People are hurting in many places. We pray for refugees, displaced persons, and asylum seekers who have found life unsafe and unbearable where they had called home. We pray for those who have been reduced to less than subsistence level by inhumane war making and pray that the madness of war that harms everyone affected will finally come to an end. We pray for those who have been dehumanized for who they are. May humanity come to recognize that all of us are equally members of one human family. There are those from among us who have requested our prayers. So together we join in prayer for the Genji family. Andre Marentet, Connie Blackert, Ezra McKinney, Jeff Richards, Lillian Laking, Pat Mason. As a church family, we join in prayer today with the congregations of our Pacific Mountain region to pray that our Advent story, which begins here again and again, year after year, may find within us hearts open to receive it anew. In the World Council of Prayer Cycle, we pray today for the countries of Brunei, Malaysia, and Singapore. We remember our sister community in El Triumfo, El Salvador, as they are confronted with climate-induced suffering, yet as a community live in hope and faith and with mutual support. We also are mindful of those in Kelowna who in winter face the harshest realities of homelessness and marginalization. We seek your guidance 
to live into reconciliation and building bonds of mutual respect with those on whose lands we live. We have been blessed and gifted in so many ways. Thank you, God. Let us now join in singing the model for prayer that Jesus taught. Now what? How about a blessing? <laughs> How about we give thanks and gratitude for all the gifts that have been given in this place today? We give thanks for the offerings that we have received, offerings of music, offerings of service and of love, offerings of a new one come to join us and be part of our community. We give thanks that we are so blessed with so much abundance. We are gifted indeed from a loving and kind creator. Let us go out into the world knowing that we are ourselves God's presence to the earth. And we are ourselves the ones that we've been waiting for. And as we go out and see what we can do, let's find a way to join in laughter and be a part of the love of God, alive and living on this earth, on this day and all days. And as we listen to our podcast, Thank you.